All right, we are still going through our series uh, on Romans, so we are at Romans 11. So let's just go ahead and pray. Lord, we just thank you again for your word. Lord, it's so rich, it's so deep. And Lord, as you say throughout the scriptures, Lord, the mystery that's been revealed and the mystery yet to be revealed. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us, even as we read the word, even as we uh, speak about it, Lord, that we would rightly divide your word. So, Lord, I ask today, Lord, just for your presence, your power, that there's power in the word of God. So, Lord, we thank you and give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, in Revelations, oh, not Revelations, Romans, where are we at? Uh, 11, you know, again, when Paul wrote the letters, the epistles, obviously there was no chapter, no verses. It was just one letter written to the church at Rome, okay? In fact, I'm sitting here in Revelation 11. I think I better get back to Romans. Uh, So, since it's just one letter written... Sometimes we have to realize that to pick up where we're going, what was said before. So in the end of chapter 10, Paul uh, says in verse 19, he says, Again I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. And I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I have found, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. So Paul's using the Old Testament to, uh, again, telegraph a couple of different things. One thing, the rejection of most Israelites to the gospel, and that the gospel was also going to be open to the Gentiles, which was something that they really hadn't thought about, that this was going not just to the Israelites, but to the rest of the world. And Jesus um, also emphasized that, and I'm going to read a couple scriptures out of Matthew, Matthew chapter 21. 21, verse 42 through 46. I actually start in verse 42. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scripture the stone the building the builders rejected? has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. He's talking to the leaders of, of, the, of Israel, of Judah, the scribes and the Pharisees. says it's going to be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Now he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Now when the chief priest and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. So the stone that the builders rejected was Jesus. And it says very clearly, they knew that he was talking, these parables, he was talking about them. So it wasn't obscured. They knew what was going on. Okay? And what do you think about, I'm just going to read a couple Verses out of John, you don't have to turn there. John 14, 6, probably a verse all of us should have memorized. It says, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. So that's pretty in their face because they would always be saying, you know, our Father is Yahweh. And he was telling them, no one comes to the Father except through the Son, receiving Yeshua, receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Also, John uh, 10, verse 16, Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and they shall be one flock and one shepherd. So there's going to be one people of God made up both of Jews, Gentiles, one people. We could call that the church. We can call that also spiritual Israel in that sense. Because remember, the the name Israel means that God governs. Under God's government. Okay, Matthew 22. I'm not going to read through that parable, but it's very obvious. The parable of the wedding banquet, how they rejected. You know, they were all too busy, all had things to do. They couldn't come to the banquet, right? <clears throat> and again, the Pharisees, the Sadducees knew that this was spoken to you against them. But Matthew 22 or actually Matthew 23, verses 33 through 39. Jesus, Jesus has been reading that, that book about, you know, making friends and influencing people. Because he says in verse 33, he says, uh, You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore I am sending you prophets, and wise men, and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in the synagogue and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all this will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks and under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A couple things through that that passage. You know, we've been having back in in chapter 9, we had that discussion of the two different views of uh, Calvinism, predestination, and Arminianism. And, you know, more free choice. And so as we're going to go through uh, Romans 11, you're going to find uh, some pretty strong statements from a Calvinistic viewpoint. But also you're going to see some from a, a free choice. And even in this passage, it's interesting that it says, but you were not willing. So... Who does the Lord put the onus on in this case? He's blaming them. He said, you were not willing to receive. Okay? But we're going to also go through some that talk about the elect, about being chosen. So we, you have to kind of balance all these things around and figure out, okay, Lord, which is it? When you get your clear answer, you can tell me. <clears throat> so, we're going to go back to Romans 11. I'm going to go ahead and start. Romans 11. Verse 
And when I'm on that, Val, it might say, you know, last time when I did <clears throat> Romans 9, Brittany had sent me a, a um, I don't know what you call it. Yeah, sent one of those. And it, anyway, it's about that subject, you know. And it was whoever this person was, and I don't remember the name, but anyway, had done an in-depth study because said that, you know, after years of not knowing which way to go, uh, said, I'm going to find out. And so did a long study and had a long ledger. And so he'd write down on one side, you know, one view, and he'd write the other side when he'd come out of the verse. And he had all these books. And so after all this long study and all this long time, he comes to the end and he goes, I don't know <laughs> any more than I did when I started. I mean, he could argue both sides. So, but he did bring up a point that I have thought about. What if they're both true? What if part of them is true? So, anyway, just as you begin your study, just kind of be asking the Lord as you see things as you go through Scripture. Okay, Lord, what are you saying? And again, in a way, it's a paradox because it seems like either one's going to be true and the other not true. But it's possible they could both be true. All right, so 11, chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to just read the first two verses. It says, I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people. So, first of all, that's a pretty strong rejection of full uh, replacement theology. And again, just for your understanding again, while it is true back in chapter 9, it talks about everyone who is an Israelite is not necessarily an Israelite. Because unless you receive Yeshua as your Messiah and are in the true Israel or the church, but at the same time, uh, that theology takes it too far because they go basically saying that, that the Lord is through with Israel, with the Jewish people. He's not going to do anything in the future. All those promises that we read are for the church. But he says very clearly here, I have, he has not rejected his people. And that he is an Israelite. Obviously, all the 12 disciples were Israelites. And so he has a purpose yet and a plan that is going to come in the future. So let's look at verses 3 through 10. And I want you to uh, just kind of Pay special attention to the different language as we go through it. It says, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he is appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at this present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer works. If it were by grace, it would no longer be grace. What then? What Israel sought so earnestly it did not obtain. But the elect did. The others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a, stup a spirit of stupor, eyes so they could not see, and ears so they could not hear, to this very day. But David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs are bent forever. So through that passage, we have 
a little different language that would, again, tend to go towards uh, predestination. There is a remnant. There's always a remnant, whether it was Israelites or whether it's today in our society. Chosen by grace. The elect did, and others were hardened. Okay, in verse 24, or 11 through 24, he says, Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. I'm using the NIV, and it uses the word envious, but I think probably a lot of your uh, interpretation will use the word jealous, and I really think jealous is probably better just because it's a little stronger. So think about that. Are we making the Jews jealous? Even if they're your enemies. Okay, verse 12. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will be their fulfillness bring? Now, I am talking to you Gentiles as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow around arouse my people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection is a reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruit is holy, when the whole batch is holy, if the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap of the olive root, do not boast over these branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. So the Gentiles are to make Israel envious or jealous. But he says in that, he says, if their rejection... So, in other words, they rejected. Well, whose fault was that? They rejected. They were broken off because of unbelief. So, again, that kind of goes on the other side of the ledger. It was because of their unbelief. And even as he warns us, he says, provided that we've been grafted in, but provided that you continue on in his goodness. In other words, as long as we do not leave the Lord and start serving another God or other gods or no God at all, we are safe in him. But if we, you always have that freedom to reject. You always have that freedom to go, I'm done, God. I don't understand. I don't know what's going on. I just I prayed this didn't happen or that didn't happen, and so I'm, I'm just done. And you have that opportunity, freedom, to reject the Lord. 
And that's why that, that warning is in there. It says, consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fail, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off, and if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be granted, grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree. How much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So again, the Lord is able to turn those tables and bring in a great harvest. I think right now uh, in Israel, the nation of Israel itself, is between 35 and 40,000 believers. Now, there are not all Jews. That, that, that's including some Arabs, okay, uh, Christians. But that's more than they've ever had before. So it is growing. And again, even though they're under some persecution, it is growing. And so we're, we're beginning to see some of that first fruit of a great harvest coming in of the Jewish people. Okay, verse 25. I do not want you to be arrogant of this mystery. Brothers, so that you may not be conceited, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, and he will turn godliness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So a couple things there. Um, Fullness of the Gentiles, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean the very last Gentile who is saved, then that is to be saved, comes into the kingdom? Is that meaning in like Matthew 24 where it says, this gospel will be preached to all the nations, the gospel of the kingdom, to all the nations of the world? When that is completed, is that the time? But what is even more interesting is all Israel will be saved. Now, you think that sounds, in a way, pretty simple. I, uh, uh, if you'd like to do a little bit of research on that, there is, a, you know, Michael Heisner, Dr. Michael Heisner, has a, a podcast all on that subject. And it's, uh, if you go to Naked Bible Podcast. And it is episode 102, and it spends like an hour and 15 minutes going through what that means. Because it means more than simply what you may look on as face value. And there's, there's like four different views. One view, uh, I'll give you the two that aren't uh, accepted very much by the majority of scholars. But one of them is that it's a replacement theology part where... They say that, you know, God's completely through with Israel. Israel, when it talks about Israel here, it's only talking about the church. Okay, so that's one extreme, and that's probably the smaller minority. Another minority would be almost opposite. There's a famous pastor in San Antonio who believes this, that we as Gentiles are saved by the blood of Jesus, but the Jews are still saved under the Old Covenant. And that's obviously a very small minority also. So the other two ones basically uh, see both, not both of those things, but see both Jew and Gentile in this with an emphasis on the Jews are the Israelites, okay? And what Michael Heisner says, says Israel, and let me read it down, he says, um, Israel is a theological construct. 
In other words, it be based on, again, the usage and the context of that, it can mean several different things. Again, as we went back to chapter 9 where it says, he who is an Israelite is not an Israelite if he doesn't receive Yeshua as their Savior. Other times it's talking about, yes, ethnic Israel. Sometimes it's talking about spiritual Israel, which includes Gentiles and Jews. And just like the church is made up of Gentiles and Jews. So anyway, there's a whole, you can spend an hour discussing that. So if you want that, again, that's Naked Bible Podcast, episode 102. Okay, verse 28, 29. As far as the gospel is concerned, he's talking about the Jewish people, the Israels. They are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and callings are irrevocable. So, their enemies, in other words, of course, during Paul's time, that was his major antagonist were the Jewish people who were attacking him, the Jewish leaders who were constantly uh, attacking him, attacking his work with the Gentiles. But look at Paul's heart. He says, I would give up, you know, I would lay down my life, my eternal life, if I could save some of them. So that's where that jealousy part comes in. Even if you are being persecuted, you know, we are told to love your enemies. So even if you are being persecuted, let's say by Orthodox Jews, you are to love them. And so that's where that, that, that steps in about making them jealous, envious, because of what they see in you. Now, the second part of that verse, because I think this is what one I've kind of heard used many times, which says, verse 29, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Now, I've heard that used sometimes by people who, let's say there's a minister and he was greatly anointed, and he got into sin, and he fell. And people go, well, but the callings are irrevocable, and the gifts of callings. But you have to re read this in context. He's talking about the nation of Israel in this time. So I think sometimes we're a little flippant in, in using that verse out of context. And he goes on in verse 30, he says, Just as you were at one time disobedient to God and have now received mercy, as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. All men have been turned over to disobedience. So I have some sad news for you all. You've all failed. We've all fallen short. We've all sinned. We've all entered disobedience. So I hate to bust anybody's bubble. But that's the way the human condition is, okay? And then he ends with a doxology in the vine part here. He says, oh, the depths, the riches, the wisdom, and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from them and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. 
And again, his ways are way above our ways. His ways, in many ways, are, are mystery. And Paul talks quite a bit about mysteries. Talks about mysteries that now are revealed, like this mystery about what was happened to the Israelites, what was gonna, that the door was going to be open to the Gentiles. But there's also other mysteries that have yet to be revealed. And especially, I think, as we go towards the end times, we need to realize that, again, before we hold our end time views too tightly to realize his ways are way above our ways, his understanding is way above our understanding, and his mysteries are yet to unfold. There's a lot yet that's going to be happening. There's a lot yet we do not understand. And there's some things we're not going to understand until we stand in his presence. Because I th I'm sure all of us have questions. You know, why, God? Why did this happen? Why didn't this happen? And we can't make sense of it in our own minds. Because it was like, Lord, I think you should have done it this way. Yeah, well, good luck with that. You know, there are things that are going to be revealed at that time, and we're all going to go, oh, oh, well, it would have helped if I knew that then, you know, <clears throat> but we're on a need-to-know basis a lot of times. So it's a mystery of God that's, that's unfolding all throughout the Scripture from, from Genesis to Revelation. And there's more that's going to be revealed to us. And that's where that trust has to come in. You know, we talk a lot about faith, you know, walking in faith. But a lot of times it's also trusting the Lord when we don't understand, when we don't have a clue, when it doesn't make sense to us. And yet we have to go back to this place and say, Lord, I don't understand, but I trust you. And I know you have a plan you have a purpose, and your, your purposes are working out. And we're going to see that answer someday. And right now, we may not understand, but we have to stand in that place of, of not just being faithful, but saying, Lord, I trust you. I don't understand this, but Lord, I trust because I know you love me. You want the best for us. And so, Lord, we, we just say, Lord, I, I trust you whether I understand or whether I don't understand. So there's a great mystery. There's a great wisdom that's way above our ways. Higher, his ways are so much higher than our ways. His understanding is so much deeper. You know, he has purposes. He has plans that he's unveiling. And there's paradoxes. Just like this whole thing of, you know, Calvinism, Arminianism, it seems like it's a paradox. And we have to live in that place. Sometimes we have to live in a place of tension where it just doesn't quite make sense. But the Lord has a plan. He has a purpose. And we just take that. We trust in that. And we say, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word that it is so rich. And Lord, we don't have to understand everything, but we just say, Lord, we trust you. And Lord, we love you. And our heart's desire is to be pleasing before you. So Lord, we just want to open ourselves up and continue to pray for your deep work within us. Lord, we ask that you renew our minds by the washing of your word. Lord, that as we sang earlier, that, that in the pressing, in the, in the crushing, Lord, you're bringing forth new wine. And, and Lord, that's not comfortable. But Lord, it is producing lasting fruit. So we say, Lord, we, we receive your crushing. We receive your pressing. Bring forth, Lord, that that new wine, that wine, Lord, of, of lasting fruitfulness, Lord. 
And Lord, whom we don't understand, Lord, help us, Lord, to only not to lean upon our own understanding, but to lean upon you. Lord, to get that place where we have total trust in you, whether we understand or whether we don't understand. So, Lord, we want to just yield our life to you afresh and anew. Lord, I ask that you would do a work within each one of us, that you put a hunger for your word. And Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't have that daily appointment with you, Lord, that they make that decision today to say, I'm going to set apart a time each day just to spend with you, to spend time in your word, to spend time worshiping you, to spend time in prayer, to have that relationship to pour out my heart so that you can do a deep work. So, Lord, I ask for encouragement for this people. Encourage them, Lord, as they continue to press in. Lord, we love you. We long for you. We long for the more. Lord, we ask for everything that you have for the human heart. Every gift. Lord, we ask for visions, for visitations, for dreams, for those prophetic gifts, Lord. Lord, for that gift of healing, that gift of faith, the working of miracles. Lord, for words of wisdom, words of knowledge, that gift of prophecy, of tongues and interpretation, that gift of discernment. Lord, that we would flow in all of your gifts. That, Lord, as we go out into the world, into those places where we influence people, that we'd be carriers of your presence. That you would give us that word that unlocks a heart. So, Lord, we need everything that you have for your people. And, Lord, just as we also sang earlier, Lord, we need a fresh fire. We need a fresh outpouring of your spirit. Lord, as as the days grow darker, Lord, you said in Isaiah 60, rise and shine, let your light shine. So, Lord, help us to be that, Lord. Because these are perilous times, Lord. We don't know what's around the next week or the next month. What's happening across the world with threats? But Lord, we trust you. And we just want to be a people who are faithful. Faithful to you, Lord. Worshippers in truth and in spirit. Lord, hearing your voice, having ears to hear, eyes to see what you're saying, what you're doing. To walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Lord, because the enemy is all around us. The culture, Lord. We're having to swim against the culture, Lord. So we ask that you would strengthen us, Lord. In this fight. In the pressing. In the crushing. To stand strong for you. To let our lights shine. So, Lord, help us, Lord. We are but flesh. We are weak vessels, jars of clay. But, Lord, empower us through your Holy Spirit. And again, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we be sensitive to that still, small voice. And, Lord, increase our love, our love for you. And, Lord, let us experience your love. Lord, that, that manifest love that, that touches our hearts, that, that brings us to tears when we experience those times, Lord. When you draw near, Lord, when you walk in the room, everything changes. So, Lord, we're wanting and desiring more and more of that. And we want to be like John the Baptist who said, 
I must decrease and he must increase. That, Lord, we would decrease our self, our, our selfish nature, our, our desire for what we want. And your presence would increase within us. So, Lord, we, we love you, Lord. Help us, even though our love is weak, help us to increase that love for you, Lord. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if anyone needs prayer this morning for healing or just whatever might be on your heart, feel free to, to come up. We're going to go ahead and have a song uh, background. And the rest of you have a blessed week next month for the rest of our lives. Let the blessing of the Lord rest upon you. Amen.